Thank you very much for your kind invitation to this wonderful conference on collecting the heritage Southeast European women philosophers. I'm very pleased to be able to be here, join you for this wonderful morning session. And uh, let me start. I hesitated a long time before writing a book on women. Simone de Beauvoir hesitated a lot. She did not want to be a philosopher. She did not want to write philosophical books. She did not dare, I would venture to say, to identify herself as a philosopher or to be such an anti-philosopher as Sartre was a philosophe dans la rue outside the institutional order and the academia, outside the university discourse, if I may say so. Women in philosophy, women and philosophy, the topic does present a problem, perhaps even a funny idea. Une troll d'idée as Geneviève Fresh, one of the leading French feminists, would say. And of course, we have this big question, why there were no great women philosophers, or were there? To use the very well-known question, first put in the context of art history. But nevertheless, the problem is here. And I think Simone de Beauvoir is a symptom. That's why I wanted to start with her. It seems that even after the groundbreaking French theory and the decentralization of the subject, the split of the subject, philosophers still seem to live in an all around wholesome world or universe as it were in a kind of, should I say, male fantasy into which even such revolutionary thinker as Simone de Beauvoir was, cannot enter. And it's true for today as well. It's not part of history. The situation I'm going to describe is a very actual one. And the problem of course arises how would it be possible to open up, at least a little bit, the closed world of male fantasies, to, to use Klaus Develite's word in this other context, in the context of intellectual world? Could it be that something doesn't really work, that something might be wrong, if I may say so, with the very idea of philosophy? with its history and its contemporary versions, with the very question, what is philosophy? With the very uh, answering the question, what is modern philosophy? Along with the well-known questions, what is of Clerunk, what is the enlightenment, what is critique, what is evolution, and so on. New paradigms have been born but use, Alain Badiou's anti-philosophy is making a turn back to philosophy. But nobody asks, none of them asks, where are women? Where are the absent women? Why they are and remain outside of philosophy, both from the philosophical discourse and from its institutional order and the academia. As you may be very well aware, uh, aware of the fact that in most of the philosophy departments all around the world, in most of the universities, the percentage of women wouldn't be higher than 20 to 25 percent. And it is not true, of course, for the students. In Ljubljana, we have approximately 50-50. Uh, 
And then uh, we'll see how it turns out. Let me now proceed with Alain Badiou, one of the most important thinkers and philosophers of the present day. One of the most influential philosophers and a rather important figure in French theory. And his vision of what he calls the French philosophical moment. Which uh, for Badiou starts with nobody else but Simone de Beauvoir's long life companion Jean Paul Sartre. I'm addressing uh, a short essay by Badiou called The Adventure of French Philosophy, which was written for the New Left Review, the journal New Left Review for the British and American audience uh, in 2005 and is published in this book, The Adventure of French Philosophy. And actually, Badiou's idea is that there are three great moments in the history of philosophy, very condensed and very specific, extremely inventive and creative. First, uh, the Greek moment, then German idealism, and of course, last but not least, the French philosophical moment or the adventure of French philosophy, which for Badiou uh, starts with Sartre's book, Being and Nothingness in 1943, and ends with Deleuze and Gattaris, Gilles Deleuze, philosopher Gilles Deleuze and psychoanalyst Felix Gattaris book entitled, What is Philosophy in 1991? And this moment is then characterized by the following main topics. The French move, this is the most important one, at least for the Ljubljana Lacanian school, I would say. The French move upon German philosophy, free H, Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, then the transformation of sciences into practice of creative thought, comparative to artistic creativity, a political, a political operation, transforming the relation between concept and action, and modernization of philosophy, uh, this is a quotation, by following contemporary artists, artistic, uh, cultural and social development, as well as new sexualities, and new modes of living, which of course is most interesting for feminism and for Simone de Beauvoir, and perhaps even most important for the French move from German philosophers or German idealism. One can immediately grasp that most of these main characteristics could be said about Simone de Beauvoir as well. However, However, her name is not mentioned at all, not even once. And if one takes into one's hand his book on the century, the 20th century or the century, published in uh, the same year, there, of course, we are confronted with the same old story, should I say. Would it be actually somebody to the question, which would be the 10 most important books of the 20th century? Then we should say The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir is the, the, the 11th, the 11th, La 11e, Beauvoir La 11e, the excluded one. The most important exclusions of the century. Namely, but you does not seem to be able to apply, to apply his own criteria. When women philosophers, women feminist thinkers aren't concerned, it seems to me that it is precisely at this point at which Simone de Beauvoir should be introduced. But he, he cannot go on, you know, and it happened to me some years ago, I gave a lecture on Simone de Beauvoir in philosophy. 
uh, at, at uh, Kingston University. And, uh, and there were also some very well known philosophers uh, actually writing books on Alain Badiou. And after my lecture, it was only after my lecture that one of them, Peter Horward, came to me and he said to me privately, privately, but you know, but you told me that he has learned so much from Simone de Beauvoir, but not a word about that during my probably too long lecture. But to make this one shorter, let me proceed with my second point, which is uh, uh, how about the other great philosophers of our time? But uh, to say just another word uh, on Simone de Beauvoir, I think she's an extremely important fi figure fro from so many points of view. She was there in the core of the uh, French philosophical moment, you know, apart from Sartre and Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Claude Lévi-Strauss and Louis Althusser and Jacques Lacan, of course. But it's, it, it's really amazing how she somehow still is not there, you know. And apart from the fact that she herself didn't consider to be a philosopher. Um, there is also this question, did she really not want to be one? Because she finished her studies in philosophy and also finished her um, straight uh, diploma in philosophy, second only to Jean-Paul Sartre. Or uh, did, she, did she not actually dare to, in a way, you know, enter this world, which I described as the world of male philosophical fantasies. And also uh, to add, uh, I think uh, one of the most important issues, she did not want to be a philosopher and she did not want to have any children, neither to enter the male world nor to enter the traditionally female uh, for her, perhaps, anti-feminist word. I've seen a, a movie uh, at some of the Simone de Beauvoir conferences where she was asked, are you actually, uh, um, is this a pro does this make a problem to you that you didn't have any children? Are you sorry? Uh, do you have any regrets? And she said, jamais, never. And that's the end of the story. So we have, you know, the two parts of the problem put together. On the one hand, how to enter the intellectual world, even for such a great philosophical figure, a literary figure, an intellectual figure, as Simone de Beauvoir was. And on the other hand, we have this very important second side, other side, the other side of the story, how actually to be able to do this, how to cope with the circumstances and the possibilities, the conditions of possibilities for women to enter something very important, very great, very new, as Badiou describes the French philosophical moment. And on the other hand, we have this of course, struggle how to be able to introduce, sorry, to introduce women philosophers and how to cope with the problem. Um, it just crossed my mind that perhaps in the context of uh, this wonderful, most interesting research at the Institute for Philosophy in Zagreb, on women philosophers or women in philosophy, as you have named your center, uh, perhaps we could also take into account or introduce the topic of the reception of women philosophers in the Yugoslav space or today in Croatia and Slovenia, because this is a very interesting story, actually. 
And of course, uh, from uh, the conceptual point of view, the problem of the other, the central concept of the other and otherness and others of contemporary philosophy, not just the French philosophical moment, but even in a broader perspective. It is Simone de Beauvoir who introduced this concept, relying on the one hand on Emmanuel Levinas, Levinas as early as in 1949, and on the other hand on Claude Lévi-Strauss at the beginning of book one of the second sex, and on Jacques Lacan at the beginning of book two in the second sex. And to say just in one sentence, uh, the way Simone de Beauvoir introduced uh, the notion and the concept of the other, it's really um, extremely, not just interesting, but important one. Uh, since, you know, uh, she is actually stating that women have always in the, existed and have always been oppressed. And this is not related to some kind of historical moment, like in the case of the Jews with the Jewish diaspora or the proletarians or the Afro-Americans and so on. So women are actually a paradigm case, or should I say a symptom, an exemplar, a, a very, uh, the most important one, how to put it, uh, for the problem of subordination and domination and how to cope with it and how to confront it. Uh, so to conclude this first part of my presentation, I would say that, of course, in political struggles, in political activism, in struggles for human rights, we have to put together all the figures of the other and the groups of the others and so on. But from theoretical and conceptual point of view, uh, women as others or the woman as the other is the paradigm case. Like for instance, Thomas Kuhn talks about exemplars in his definition of scientific paradigms or like uh, Georgia Agamben goes on with applying Thomas Kuhn to um, Michel Foucault and the problem of this paradigmatic exemplar, which is at the same time uh, a general rule and a, a concrete exemplar of uh, the most important kind. It's in Hegelian terms, this would mean putting together the abstract, as in by your case, the abstract notion of philosophy as universal. And on the other hand, this concrete, in Badiou's case, uh, moments, condensed moments of very concrete and specific forms of philosophy, Greek, German, and then the French philosophical moment with no women, whatever. That does present a problem, I think, you know, especially when Badiou is actually uh, so fond of the idea of the greatness and inventiveness and this breaking through a dimension of these uh, philosophical inventions. And, of course, I should mention uh, the interview Alain Badiou uh, gave in uh, Germany at the Humboldt University, I think, together with uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, La Tradition Allemande dans la Philosophie. It was in, established in uh, 2017, where Badiou goes on with this idea of great moments in philosophy, this condensation. But you actually uh, uh, relies on Hegel saying that this is the concrete ab abstraction of philosophy, these three moments. And then he talks about, um, I have to quote this to you. Uh, 
the French Dutch. <clears throat> Uh, as, as the Americans would say, um, a very important one, and so on and so on. But then he goes on. I have to improvise a little bit because this is in French. He goes on uh, saying, uh, lequel, lequel, the French moment, the one, uh, probably, possibly, peut-être. Franco Sloven, French Slovene moment, but you says. If we take into account, if we n'oublions pas, let us not forget, let us not forget Slava Zizek and his descendants. And then he goes on how this moment has started. Uh, and then it goes on with Heidegger and uh, Derrida and structuralism and Lacan and Foucault and so on. Of course, no Simone de Beauvoir there. But at least we have this Slavo Zizek, not Slovenian moment, not the fourth one, not Slovenian Croatian. I would say uh, later on I will proceed with the idea because I'm sure that Slavo Zizek is part of this geophilosophical space and this great philosophical moment of the Yugoslav philosophy. And um, I'm sure that the next speaker is going to tell you more about this in relation to the journal Praxis, uh, the Marxism, the importance of philosophical uh, Yugoslav tradition and so on and so on. But let me proceed from this <laughs> franco slovene moment, but usually uh, quite an interesting thinker. Uh, no, no women at all, definitely not. But to this Slovene moment with Slava Zizek as one of the most prominent thinkers of our time and most prominent, most widely known philosophers ever. So, yeah. We have some more 10 minutes, five minutes. No. Oh, thank you because very much. Oh, that's great. And so let me return to Freud if we have one hour. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, to Lacan's return to Freud, Jacques Lacan, one of the most known psychoanalysts of the 20th century and of the present day, and his idea of a return to Freud related to his transformation of Freud's psychoanalysis through the linguistic turn. I should have already mentioned that one of the major figures of the French philosophical moment described by Alain Badiou is related to Freud. Badiou calls it with or against Freud, with or against, and there are some on the one side and some others on the other side, but it actually means not without Freud. If we live today in contemporary philosophical world, we should definitely take that into account with or against Freud. And here we are in the middle of Lacan's return to Freud, uh, to say it once again, related to his transformation of Freud's psychoanalysis, I should say the birth of psychoanalysis, considering uh, the way we should approach a problem um, through the linguistic turn. More precisely, Lacan addressed structural linguistics, at first inaugurated by Ferdinand de Saussure and elaborated further by Roman Jakobson and later, this is all I'm going to say about Saussure and Jakobson, don't worry, because I want to introduce Emil Benvenist, a most important linguist uh, who has been put into the forefront in contemporary French philosophy uh, by most inventive, most inspiring philosophers like Etienne Balibar, um, Bruno Cersenti, and some others. Why we as philosophers? should be interested in what the linguists have to say. Why we, not being Lacanians, 
would actually decide to read either Saussure or, as I would like to suggest, Emil Benveniste. But actually, it was in this context, in this, should I say, second turn of contemporary French philosophy, French philosophical moment, to linguists, to Emile Benveniste, that Lacan actually introduced the concept of truth as the main focus of psychoanalytic treatment. And the concept of truth is really something that is most important for the whole long history of philosophy, let alone contemporary French thought. And Lacan actually related it to the main division of Freud, namely to that of the difference between the consciousness and the unconscious, or the ego and the it, in Freud's metapsychology metapsychological paper on the ego and it, the Sihunda says, from 1923. Speaking about psychoanalytic treatment, such a return to Freud goes very well along its characterization as talking cure, as one of the hysterics, most known hysteric probably in history, NLO. Breyer's patient from Freud's and Breyer's studies in hysteria named it what we are doing here, doctor. It could be named the talking cure, the talking cure. And the problem that is related to truth. And I have to say that this is really a most inspiring starting point on the one hand to introduce the women question to uh, express this with freud's very question was will das vibe what does the woman want was will das vibe? on the one hand freud very much insisted uh, that they were not we are not dealing with humans in general with men in general with the mankind but there are women and there are men, or there are girls and boys, if we think about uh, the early development on the one hand. And on the other hand, this very insistent of Lacan uh, in relation to the concept of truth. Because the truth in this context, you know, in, 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 in psychoanalytic treatment, it cannot be the truth of this as defined in in the history of philosophy as uh, the relationship between thinking and the outside world or whatever. And this moment of truth, it's what I would like to put into the forefront in uh, the second part of my presentation. Why Benveniste? Why Lacan? <laughs> Even more so. <laughs> Benveniste? made a very, should I say, Lacanian or post-Lacanian or Beauvardian or post-Beauvardian move, put it into the forefront what is, I think, extremely important for philosophy as such, for the question of what is philosophy, what is modern philosophy, and how to start with a new answer to this old question. As you all know, the first step of Lacan's return to Freud in his return to Saussure, or return to Freud by way of, by way of Saussure, he introduced, Lacan introduced the notion of the sign into psychoanalysis. I was actually reluctant to do it once again, but I'm doing it. <laughs> Just, just a word or, or so, uh, because I want to proceed from these traditional stories of the science and the signified and the signifiers to Benveniste and the truth in speaking, the truth in talking cure. Uh, what Lacan first introduced is uh, the turn 
of the relationship between the signified or the sig and the signifier, which is the notion and the acoustic image, upside down, saying the signifier is on the top, getting hold of. Avar Barsir, in his essay in Eclipse on the instance of the letter in the unconscious or reason according to Freud. But then again, Lacan's idea was, you know, how, how to go on from linguistics to traditional, should I say, philosophical problems. And he also introduced uh, the most important, uh, how should I say, discussion, distinction in logic. He was very fond of Aristotelian and other logics, where the statements have a truth value where the statements are either true, either true or false. And now we are confronted with the problem. How to cope with this? What is true? What has a truth value or not? In talking cure, in uh, philosophy as an, a long oral tradition beyond writing, beyond reducing philosophical discourse, to writing a text, to make commentaries, to make interpretations, and to translate and so on. Like uh, Ad, um, Ado, Pierre Ado actually characterized the long tradition philosophy um, introduced after the, uh, the Greek philosoph philosophical moment with Christianity in the Middle Ages until uh, the present day. This distinction between oral tradition and writing and interpreting and whatever. So actually, I would like to go back to, could I actually say, I would not venture to do it, but uh, perhaps uh, as a kind of a link between the two, to make a bridge uh, to say that we are coping here with another problem and the truth related to the problem, not whether the statements are true or not, but the very side of enunciation in talking cure or in oral um, presentation or teaching of philosophy. And this is what actually Etienne Balibar did. The enunciation in its function can be either true or false, but this does not go for the very act of enunciation. And this is what Benveniste analyzed as subjectivity in language. He wouldn't say, dare to say the subject in language because he was a linguist and wouldn't dare to present himself as a philosophy, as a philosopher. But this is actually perhaps uh, actually exactly the problem we have, the problem we have in Descartes and his cogito, uh, enouncing cogito ergo sum. And this is another approach, a very important one. Subjectivity in language and what Emile Benvenist called formal apparatus of enunciation in his problems of general, the book called Problems of General Linguistics. And this is what puzzled Lacan very much. The ego that says ego has no truth value at all. And this is also something what puzzles Etienne Balibar very much. And it is on this basis that the, the, the distinction, sorry, <clears throat> the distinction should be made between the content, the object of enunciation and the site of enunciation. And this is a very important issue, which is actually to be compared to the difference between the locus or the site of the gaze in Copernican turn and the object of the observation. Here again, we have the two sites. In language, we have the site from which the talking cure or uh, in general, Talking is carried on, the act of 
talking. And in Copernicus, we have the site from which Copernicus could actually make his major Copernican revolution in relation, in the distance, to the object, the astronomical, um, the planetary system, and so on, and so on. So here we have actually um, a very important, extremely important move or break, or should I say revolution. The Copernican revolution in the 20th century, which is not related to the gaze, what can be seen, what cannot be seen, what, uh, which position should we take to see what was not seen before, to make the Copernican turn, as you all know later on, uh, developed further by Immanuel Kant, and of course Freud also somehow turns the whole story upside down. But then it is, I, uh, this insistence of the two sides, you know, which then in, in language, in return to language, in contemporary French philosophy, and this is extremely important actually for the whole 20th century, it starts with, with Wittgenstein at the beginning of the century and then goes on and gone, on and on, <laughs> not gone. <laughs> it was not a Freudian slip, it was a mechanical, <laughs> no, not gone, because I think this is really uh, very much in the core of contemporary French moment, French philosophical moment, but it is not there in the Franco-Slovene moment. And I'm here to promote the idea that we should go beyond this great Franco-Slovene moment with, should I say, somehow to traditional Lacanian thinking uh, in, in, uh, in the world, <laughs> and to proceed through this very idea, which I'm going to uh, uh, explain in it very shortly uh, in two steps, in two very short steps. It was actually Jacques Lacan, who apart from elaborating on this problem of truth, not the truth of the enunciation, but the truth of the speaker, the truth of the ego who says ego, the truth that speaks, the speaking truth, addressed in his essay in Ecri on uh, the sense of the return, the Freudian thing, La Chose Freudian, the Freudian thing, or the sense of the return to Freud, uh, where this truth of uh, the speaker, of the one who speaks, is related, uh, to put it uh, in a very summarized manner, most interesting for Lacan, it is related to Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche saying uh, in relation to Plato, turning Plato upside down, me, Plato, am the truth. This is Nietzsche. Me, Plato, am the truth. And then Lacan invented his own psychoanalytic formula, moi, la vérité, je parle. I, the truth, speak. And this truth of the sound of speaking, of talking cure, of enunciation, cannot be reduced to any kind of uh, difference between what is true and what is not true. I am giving you a secret, Lacan goes on, Lacan tells us, so that you will be able to find me where I am. So we have nothing else but the sight of speaking, of enunciation, of this, to put it in Benjamin's term, ego, that says ego. Of course, it is defined in Benjamin's to, to a relation to you and the exchange between the I and the you. But the whole story goes around uh, the personal pronouns and later on with the pronouns. Uh, uh, yes, uh, with, with other, uh, with the whole context. And it is on the first side, but only only at the first side, that this seems to be something which is really a specific linguistic problem, but it has nothing to do with philosophy. It has everything to do with philosophy. And it has everything to do 
with the possibility of introducing women to philosophy, to contemporary philosophy, to the question of what is modern philosophy in conceptual terms. Because, why? Because there is a big difference between Copernican turn in uh, the context of the gaze and the two sides of seeing and not seeing, or bad seeing, or so on, and seeing uh, and making a Copernican turn in this traditional uh, scientific and philosophical uh, framework, and the structural homologous turn in language. And philosophy has to do everything with language. And uh, this is going to be my final point, which is, it is really amazing how Jacques Lacan was able to introduce in the context of his uh, return to Freud through Saussure so and Benveniste, sexual difference, difference between men and women in his, I would actually have to have this picture. Uh, would you be able to help me perhaps? And I will actually, this, yes. There we go. Remove with the arrows here. Uh -huh. with the arrows, with the the arrows yeah. Here are the arrows. Here are the arrows. Here are the arrows. Oh, here, yeah, thank you very much. Let me see. Yeah. Now, as usual, a feminist with Pussy Riot. Okay, here on the left side, we have this new propaganda in Slovenia <laughs> breastfeeding. <laughs> You, now you can see why Simone de Beauvoir didn't want to have any children, not any breastfeeding. This propaganda is very strong in Slovenia now. Women should breastfeed more and more <laughs> and have less time for philosophy. I'm not sure. But let me go on with this conceptual uh, major breakthrough of Jacques Lacan. I haven't found anything similar in any of the linguists or any of philosophers and so on, which goes on like this. Um, on the left side, we have this, uh, um, yeah, I, the truth, the speaking truth. I will tell you the truth and so on and so on. So the truth, which is related to the very side of enunciation, of talking and so on. And on, on the right side, which is on your left, uh, we have this very short uh, that's very, yeah, this, actually, these two illustrations um, coming from Saussure and then uh, Lacan's edition. As I already mentioned, Lacan turned Saussurean relationship between the signified and the signifier upside down. And then immediately after that, it is one of the most amazing moments of the French philosophical moment. He said, as soon as a human being enters language, and if, if he or she doesn't enter language, it's psychosis, it's the clinical picture of psychosis. So this is something which we all have to do. Then uh, this individual has to decide for one of the two possible positions in language, either male or female. Or here we have this illustration with two doors, two toilet doors, a very famous illustration, which also figures uh, in Slava Zizek so many times he mentions this very important insight of Lacan, but 
there again, also in his uh, last book published together with Jean-Claude Mil uh, Jean Milner and Juan Pablo Lucelli, Sexuality en Travaux, Sexualities, already mentioned in the relation to Badiou, Sexualities uh, in the Working. This is where uh, um, also Slava Zizek somehow is not able to proceed. And I wonder whether this is not related to the way he uh, also addresses feminism. It's, it's, you know, I would say a rather a superficial way. It, of course, generally, on a general level, uh, Slava is in favor of feminism. But then on conceptual level, uh, this is actually the point, you know, uh, related to feminism on the one hand, feminism philosophy, or to introducing sexual difference in Lacan, in language, in philosophy, women in philosophy. I, I have this impression, I'm not sure you might be able to help me with this, that, that he doesn't go on with his thinking, you know, with his most inventive thinking. I have learned so much from Slava Zizek, but I cannot see how come that there's a barrier here. Like in Lacan, but Lacan at least was able to say there are men and women and we have to deal with it and we have to introduce women and the women question. This is a little bit of my interpretation, of course, into the whole long story of history philosophy and of the major break of uh, philosophy in relation to Freud with an against Freud uh, in the 20th century. And then uh, I, I'm not, um, I don't know why, it, it might be the case that uh, Slava Zizek uh, is so, uh, in a way, you know, in a way, yeah, uh, it might be related to kind of a dimension of obscenity. Uh, you know the story of uh, the difference between the toilets, the American toilets and European toilets and so on. You had this whole long story. I think it might be also, in a way, a kind of avoidance of the main conceptual problem of how to deal with this uh, notion, the concept of sexual difference, which is a major psychoanalytic concept, which cannot be found anywhere in philosophy, apart from philosophy and psychoanalysis uh, context and feminism and psychoanalysis tradition. And this is where we should go on. Professor this is the end. Is yes, the end. just the final point, uh, which is that in Copernican term and the whole history related to it and in Kant, and we'll see uh, about the others later in the discussion, we cannot have the introduction of sexual difference as a conceptual level. But with the linguistic turn in a 20th century philosophy through psychoanalysis, we can have the Copernican turn in language, which actually enables us through Lacan, through how we could proceed from this point of view, to introducing women into the very core of the, should I say, Saussurian, Benvenistian Copernican turn related to the south of enunciation, where Simone de Beauvoir has to be addressed. Simone de Beauvoir was actually the one who preceded, although chronologically before Lacan, she was the one who started the second sex by introducing the very point of enunciation, saying, I have hesitated a long time, but I am a woman. And this is the truth. I am a woman. I speak as a woman. I write as a woman. And this is uh, the truth, the speaking truth of Simone de Beauvoir, and I think it's the major breakthrough for the whole long history of philosophy. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.